Good morning. Let's be opening up our Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, we continue our study here today. Let's begin reading here in verse 9. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his generation. Noah walked with God, and Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, we've been talking about Noah, and we saw how that in the day of Noah, the thoughts and intents of man's heart, evil continually. We talk about how bad things are in the world around us today in our society, but when we read the Old Testament, can we carry a candle to what they were involved in? You talk about the wickedness that you read about in the Old Testament, it is astounding Uh, the wickedness that we see there, wickedness that we don't know yet in our world. And especially when you get down to the fact that human sacrifice, child sacrifice was uh, a common practice in the religions of the day, and how even God's people in the time of the nation of Israel fell into these practices, uh, a horrific situation to live in. But here in the days of Noah, things are just as dark and as bad as they can get. But Scripture tells us what about Noah? He walks with God, and because he walks with God, he finds what? Favor, grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that makes all the difference. And God, in looking at the situation, says, I repent that I've created the world, everything in it, but here's what we're going to do. The world is going to be destroyed and everything in it, but through Noah, there's going to be salvation. And so God commissions Noah, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take gopher wood. I want you to build an ark. I want you to cover it with pitch inside and out. It's to be these dimensions. It's to have this window in it. When the door of the ark's open, I'll bring the animals to you, Noah. You get them in the ark. I'll close up the door, and here comes the flood. And Noah, because he walks with God, begins to build this ark. He begins to build the ark, and as Scripture says, he does so in every detail what God had told him to do. He was obedient to the will of God. Now, that's an amazing thing in and of itself, because when you think about obeying God, how many of us here could say that we obey God in every detail of his will for our lives? That, that's kind of a challenge sometimes, isn't it? But this was Noah, and he obeyed God in every detail. So when the ark is closed up, here's Noah and his family, And for a total of 150 days, they're in that ark. The flood lasts 40 days. And as Noah's building this ark, I wonder what's going through his mind. Because up to this point, there had been no rain on the earth. There had been nothing like a flood on the earth. These were new things. God opened up the heavens. He opened up the earth. And here came the waters of the flood from above and below. And the Scripture tells us that the highest mountain peak, 15 meters below that, was the highest mountain peak when the water crested. So the whole earth is underwater. Noah doesn't have a point of reference for what God is talking about at this point. But he obeys God, he builds the ark, and salvation comes to the world through Noah. In the darkest of moments, first lesson, there is always reason to hope. Now, are we good at that in the darkest of moments? (laughs) What, Carla? We worry, don't we? We worry, we fret, we become negative, we become pessimistic. There's nothing good going on. There's nothing here. There's nothing. We're just in trouble, and it's just going to go from bad to worse. And in the midst of the worst that ever was, God looks down on the earth, and here's Noah. And God is hopeful. And we're going to save mankind through the obedience of Noah. In the darkest moments, when Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, he's been telling us about Jesus and how he was willing to come and obey the Father. He says, now, you need to have this mind that Christ had, You need to be willing to obey the Father, and so much so that you need to shine like stars in the darkness. Good description there of us in the world, isn't it? 
as God's people, we are the light shining in the darkness. Adds to what Jesus said in Matthew 5, you're the light of the world, you're the salt of the earth. We are the light shining in the darkness. There is always reason to hope in this world, brothers and sisters, because the church of Jesus Christ exists today in this world. And when we talk about the church, are we talking about our our physical structure here? No, we're talking about the people. We are the church, and as long as we are here, there is reason to hope in this world. There is reason for us to believe God is still at work, and God's will is going to be done, and as God's people, we are going to make a difference. That's the light shining in the darkness. Now, is that the way we feel about things? Is that the hope that we live with day to day? And this hope based upon the fact Noah, when God spoke, he obeyed, and he obeyed in every detail. And when we think about that, we're reminded of the words of Jesus in John 14. If you love me, you will what? Keep my commandments. You will obey. And that's how I know that you love me. And that's how we see our love for God in our lives People can look at us and make a judgment about us by the fruit they see being born in our lives. And when they see obedience, they can say, these people love God. Now, they may not like that, but they have to acknowledge the fact, these people love God, they're obedient. Adds to what Paul would say in Romans 6 when he's talking there to the church in Rome, he says, okay, you you have an issue here. You've come up with this idea that where sin abounds, there's more and more grace, so you develop the attitude that I'm going to sin the most so that I get the most grace from God. And the Christian people in the church there in Rome, they were in competition with each other to see who could be the greatest sinner. Now, that's interesting, isn't it? (laughs) Who can be the greatest sinner among God's people? Because that's the person that gets the most grace. Now, we don't live that way, do we? Do we ever take advantage of the grace of God? Well, he'll forgive me. Will he? If we're looking and saying, I'm going to go ahead and do it and he'll forgive me. Paul said in the middle of that discussion, you need to understand that when you were baptized, when you went to the water and you were immersed, you became one with Christ. As Christ died, you were dying to the old man of sin. As he was buried, you're being buried. And as you're raised up out of the water, you're raised up like he was raised up. Just as he went through a death, burial, and resurrection, you're experiencing a death, burial, and resurrection. And the significance of that is the old man of sin that was here dies and is buried and what is raised up is new if anyone is in Christ he is a new creation we died to sin and his question in that passage how shall we who died to sin live in it any longer and then you go on in verse 17 of that chapter and say I'm grateful from the heart that you obeyed that form that pattern of teaching that was given to you And then he goes on to discuss the fact that they died to sin because they'd been immersed, they'd been saved. Obedience. It's a theme that runs all throughout the Word of God, and that is our bottom line, so to speak, in the kingdom of God. That's our measuring stick. Do I love God? Am I obedient to His will? Did Noah love God? Yes or no? And how do we know that? He was obedient to God's will. It's the same for you and I today. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Folks, that's why there's always reason to hope. As long as there are people on this earth who are willing to love God, who are willing to obey God, that means Jesus is still here on the earth That means the Father is still with us. That means the Holy Spirit is still present. And if Father, Son, and Holy Spirit living through us is present in this world, there is always reason to hope. 
there is always reason to hope. Something for us to think about. Talking with a brother here a few days ago. Well, Michael, I just hope we don't blow it. Well, first off, who's we? Well, the church. Okay? You hope we don't blow it. How can you and I blow the work and will of God? How can we destroy that? If Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are at work in God's people, if we are being obedient and if we are allowing His will to be done in our lives, how do we blow it? And bottom line, even if we choose not to be obedient, how does the work of God get hindered by that? Now, yeah, we, we are light and salt. We are examples. And people may look at us and go, you're a Christian? You're the church? But does that change the fact God is faithful? Does that change the fact that Jesus came and died for our sins? Does that change the fact that the Holy Spirit lives within us? If what we do changes God, God's in trouble, isn't he? (laughs) Why did Jesus come to die? Well, I hope we don't blow it. Why would we blow it? God has people that he always works through. And in the midst of all the darkness of this ancient world, here was Noah. And Noah found what? Grace, favor in the eyes of God. Folks, we're the Noah of this day, this generation. We are the people who have found grace and favor in the eyes of God. The day that we went to the waters and we were immersed, we confessed Jesus, we were immersed, God washed us clean, we became those new creations. God said, you're mine now. You now have my grace and favor. Follow the example of your brother Noah. You're going to make a difference in this world. You're going to make a difference in this world. Now, does that mean Noah was perfect? No. And before we break out into a cold sweat and think, is he saying we've got to be perfect? Well, no. Because once the 150 days are up and they finally, you know, the ark settles on Mount Ararat and they leave the ark, within just a little while, Noah is able to plant a vineyard. As soon as the vineyard grows, the harvest is done and they make wine. And Noah does what? He gets drunk on his wine. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And that's why he was able to make that vineyard and make that wine. Not perfect, but that's a part of us being light in this world. If you and I had to go out here into the world and tell people, okay, you have to become what I am, I have perfectly obeyed God, and I don't sin, and you need to follow in my footstep, who's going to listen? Who's going to want that? Do you want that? Do I want that? No. But if we can say we have found grace and favor in the eyes of the Lord and when we do get drunk and come to our senses, he forgives us. And when we do blow it, so to speak, he forgives us and we keep right on going because our God is the God of the next chance. Not second chances, but the next chance. Because how many next chances are you and I going to need in our lives? Anyone here right now in need of a next chance? Yeah. (laughs) See what we're learning here? Noah, his obedience, he loved God. God used that man. There was hope in this world. Brothers and sisters, as long as you and I live, there is hope in this world. And that's a comforting thought, isn't it? A comforting thought because you and I live. There is reason to hope in this world. So Noah, he builds this ark. 
You ever wonder what that would have been like, getting those animals together in the ark and God closing up that door? You ever wonder what that would have been like? Every living thing, a pair of every living thing. All kinds of critters, all kinds of animals. Ugh. A pair of scorpions. A pair of centipedes. A pair of snakes. A pair of ticks. A pair of fleas. Now we don't think about that very often, do we? So we think about the the giraffe and the monkey and the hippo and well, there are lots of things on this ark. And this is where interesting discussion takes place. Well, how did Noah do this? How did he get all those animals there? How did he take care of those animals? How much food did they have to take on the ark? And on and on it goes. You know what? God never says. <laughs> he just says, build the ark. I'll bring the animals. Noah, you get them on the ark. I'll close the ark up. And my work's going to be done. Now, there's all kinds of possibilities. All kinds of possibilities. The one that I personally like, that to me makes some sense, but it's not Bible. These were kind of young animals that came on the ark, young critters, in pairs. Old enough to start breeding, but small enough in size that they weren't the big full-grown mamas and daddies. They were the future So you bring smaller, younger animals on board, and then God says, hibernate. And for 150 days, they hibernate on that ark. That takes care of a lot of issues, a whole lot of issues. And if God didn't do it that way, boy, no, and his family, they worked. Feeding and watering And cleaning up after? Man. But whatever, it got done. And towards the end of the time after the flood abates, and can you imagine what that was like? That door's closed. The floodwaters are coming up. And there may be people outside pounding on the side of that ark. Noah! Noah! And they hear the wailing and the screams and the begging and the pleading. Can you imagine what that was like? And folks, that's a picture of God right there that we don't like to deal with. But there does come a moment in time, and the Bible shows us this from Genesis all the way through Revelation. There does come a moment in time when God is through with people. When he said, enough's enough. And I've given chance after chance after chance after chance after chance. I even put my son on the cross and let you kill him. And there comes a moment in time when just no more. And that's a sad state of affairs, isn't it? But that can happen. But even in those moments, there's reason to hope. Because for the people on the outside, there were the people on the inside. The people that had obeyed God. And so it's close to the end of the time when the floodwaters start abating. The scripture says from the earth they start going down. And Noah takes a raven and sends him out of the ark. And the raven flies to and fro on the earth. Just keeps flying to and fro. Then Noah sends out a dove. And the dove goes out and flies to and fro. But the dove brings back a little sprig of green leaf. And Noah knows, ah, (laughs) there's life again, plant life on the earth. And so seven days later, he sends out the dove again, and the dove goes to and fro and doesn't come back. And Noah now knows what? 
She's found what she needs to survive and to live. And another seven days later, the ark rests on the mountain. And God opens up the ark. And Noah and his family and all the creation step from the ark. And what does Noah and his family notice? A rainbow. And God says, Noah, this is my covenant, my sign to you. Never again will the whole earth be destroyed with a flood. And has God been faithful to that covenant? Yeah. Because from that moment on, now there have been local floods. Y'all are going down to help people that have been in a pretty major flood. But it didn't cover the whole earth. And every time you and I see a rainbow now, what comes to our minds? Noah. (laughs) And God said, here's the sign of my covenant. Just like he made a covenant with all of us. He said, here's the sign of my covenant. As often as you do this, do this what? In, I forget, we're all of that age. In remembrance (laughs) That's what this says, in remembrance of me. There's the sign of my covenant. And you keep doing that until I return. God is faithful to his covenants, and he gives us signs of those covenants. And they come out of the ark, and everything starts all over again. Now, can you imagine what that was like? The moments of joy, the moments of excitement, the moments of hope. Folks, there's our lives as new Christians. Because for you and I, in the Christian life, every single day is what? The day that the Lord has made. And we will what? Rejoice and be glad in it. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Every day is a new day. A new way to begin again. And folks, new beginnings. What what does that do for us? Ask David and Lori Hoyle right now about new beginnings. And what are you going to hear from David and Lori? You're going to hear about that little granddaughter. And what does that little girl represent? A new beginning. Ask Carla about new beginnings. And Carla, who are you going to talk about? Those little grandbabies. Ask Bill and Debbie. Now, you don't have any babies anymore, but you're going to talk about who? He's about this tall and about this broad. And <laughs> but there, there's new life. There's a new beginning. Ask Michael. Ask Roger and Liddell. New beginnings. And we talk about them, and we're joyful, and we're hopeful. And we pray about these new beginnings and we live for these new beginnings and we put everything into them. And if any man would come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. You remember the moment you went to the water and you confessed Jesus and you were immersed? Remember how it felt? I'm getting goosebumps right now, thinking about it. I remember when I came up out of that water, oh, so relieved, so excited, so thrilled. Every single day, we deny ourselves, we take up our cross, and we start again. That's how God blesses us with his favor so that we don't forget. And then when we meet together this morning, 
right, right here's the focal point of everything in our lives. And he said, okay, you renew yourself every day. There's hope and excitement every day. But when you come together on the first day of the week, all of you together are going to remember the moment of new beginning. And this thrills us and excites us and gives us hope and gives us renewed faith and gives us strength. And when we walk out of here in a little while, the devil's shaking his head and going, I can't believe those folks. I thought it was going to be an easy week. Because of that old Villa Church of Christ, I've got my hands full now. And if every other church in the area comes out the same way, I'm in big trouble. And do we give the devil that kind of reason to worry and doubt? We sit and worry and doubt. Let's let the devil sit and worry and doubt, okay? And there's this new beginning. Folks, that's our promise in our lives. A new beginning. I have a prayer app on my phone. And I love this prayer app because every single morning a new prayer comes out and they keep all their prayers. I bet they've got 500 different prayers on this prayer app that you can go to and you can listen to any one at any time. But every day a devotional comes up and a person leads you through scripture and through prayer and you have a two-minute thing you can click on, a five-minute thing, a 10-minute, and a 15-minute thing. And you can choose how much time you want to listen, how much time you want to spend in prayer, how much time you want to hear them read the scriptures. And I usually pick about the 10-minute thing, and it usually lasts about 15 minutes, but it's amazing. But there's one prayer that I have saved in that app, and one of the reasons I saved it, because in the middle of this prayer, the person praying says, and Father, I thank you for this new day that it will be an adventure it will be an adventure and not more of the same. And the first time I heard that, that hit me like a ton of bricks. This person of faith praying, Father, every day, I thank you. It's a new beginning. It's an adventure. Not more of the same. Do we ever settle for more of the same? If we were to take a piece of paper out right now, put our name at the top and write down about our lives over the last seven days, what would be the description of last Monday? Last Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. What would be our description of today? More of the same? Routine? Or would the word adventure fit in every single day? Because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And I wonder if Noah, after the ark, would have done that. The whole preparing for the ark and the flood itself, talk about an adventure. But can you imagine being Noah and his wife and watching their three sons and their wives? Can you imagine being a part of the rebuilding of God's creation? God allowing you to be the father and mother of his world and every single day something new is happening there is an adventure can we imagine what that would be like and for you and I today isn't it the same way because if anyone is in Christ he slash she is a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And in Christ, the newness is something that is renewed every single day. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the 
renewing of your mind. Every day becomes an adventure. Now, is that a challenge? Let's see hands. Is that a challenge? It, it is, isn't it? Because, first off, we like routine, don't we? We like our lives done in a certain way. And we reach a stage in life when the kids are gone and the grandkids, they come to see us on occasion, and we get settled in, and we have our routines. And what happens when something comes along to mess up that routine? Travis and Alfreda are getting new carpet right now. You love the messy house, don't you? Your routine has been upset, right, Alfreda? Pray for me. <laughs> Can anybody relate? <laughs> the routine has been pray for Travis <laughs> because if Alfreda's stressed, you know what's going on with Travis. The routine is broken, and what happens? At this stage of life, we almost panic, don't we? And then we start realizing we're more like our fathers and our mothers than we ever wanted to be. Those two grumpy old people that we put up with when they were alone and by themselves, and we did, come on, mom and dad. Now all of a sudden, our kids are saying the same thing about us. We like routine. Now that's a challenge in and of itself. Because if God is wanting to give us a new beginning, an adventure every single day, and we like routine, what can happen? We miss out on the newness and the adventure because we like being settled. Can anybody relate? Yeah. And so in this story, we learn, look, look here. <laughs> look, look at Noah and his wife. What must it have been like every single day after that ark is opened? The animals begin to scatter, but I'm sure that there was probably some close proximity in all of that to get to help the animal kingdom, to get to help your sons and your daughters-in-law, to get to watch the grandkids, to get to rebuild, to get to make everything new again. With some difficulties, but still... The newness. There's the hope, folks. And that's why Jesus says, you and I are salt and light in this world. Because we have within us everything we need for life and godliness. That sounds like scripture, doesn't it? Go home today and read Second Peter chapter 1. He has given us everything we need for life and godliness through a knowledge of His Son. Everything we need for life to be an adventure. Because folks, for you and I, just to get the fruit of the Spirit being produced in our lives, is that enough of an adventure? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control... That's enough of an adventure right there, isn't it? But to reach out beyond that and to allow that fruit to impact the people around us, to make a difference in our neighborhoods, to make a difference in our, our jobs, to make a difference in the social organization I'm in, to teach my children, my grandchildren, to be salt and light in this world and let them see that through me. Man, talk about exciting. With a little bit of agitation along the way. Because when you get to dealing with these grown kids, don't you just love the way they use your grandchildren against you? They give you that look like, you better get in line or else. And we all know what else is, don't we? We ain't going to get to see those grandbabies. So you put on this smile when you're with them and then when they turn away and look it, like the kids go eh, you're going eh, you know <laughs> but to be able to be a part of their lives well we all know what I'm talking about don't we isn't it terrible to be held hostage and Norman Kim your day's coming get ready get ready Woo. but something tells me Ben's already figured out how to do that with y'all even without grandkids 
But you know, I mean, it's just the sheer excitement and adventure that we have the privilege of living out in our lives. Folks, this is what God has in mind for us. This is the story of Noah. And you and I get to live that story out every single day we live. Amen? And that's our lesson for this morning. Take a break, and we'll start again at 10, and I'll be back in the pulpit about 10.30. So appreciate you being here.